tonight we're going to talk about insurance and I wouldn't say this is the number one question I get, but I do get it quite often. And last year we had a session on insurance and we had two speakers. One was from Easter Seals who is outsourced, who Kaiser outsources their autism treatment to. And so that if you're covered by Kaiser, that might be a good one for you to watch. And the other speaker was from Cal Optimum, and Cal Optimum is the insurance provider for um, Medi Cal. So if you're on Medi Cal, that would be a good one to watch. But no matter how many people we have come speak about this, there's always other questions. And so t tonight we were are lucky to be joined by uh, Peter Freeberg and Neil Steinman. Uh, Peter is with Cigna. And the way I became aware of him is through Robin, our vice president, who was working with either Peter or someone else in the group at Cigna, who provided something like a concierge service to the insured with Sigma to help them navigate support for autism. And Robin suggested that that would be a really excellent place to start. So I'm really happy to have Peter here. Neil Steinman, I have a relationship with, I, uh, to be honest. He is my insurance um, uh, representative. He helped me get uh, covered California when I left my job, and he helped me get on Medicare recently. So now you know how old I am. <laughs> and um, I've recommended him from time to time because sometimes people have uh, need private insurance. And I thought it would be helpful for Peter to uh, provide some framework to help people navigate it. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. As usual, I'd like you to stay muted during the meeting. If you have questions, put it in the chat. Peter's gonna go first because he has young children and he begged me to let him finish early. So we'll have him finish up, maybe do some questions and then we'll move on to Neil, and without any further uh, dialogue from me, I welcome Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi, yes, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, my, my wife is on her first work trip uh, in the COVID era, and I've got both daughters currently watching a movie uh, until we get up to, we get them to bed at time, but uh, thank you for having me. I'm just gonna pull my screen up here. Um, so, uh, as mentioned, my name is uh, Peter Freeberg, and I'm a licensed mental health therapist, and I work for Cigna, and I just kind of want to highlight some of the things that we have been doing over here at Cigna to assist our members and their families as it relates to autism. I've been with Cigna for a little over eight and a half years. Uh, closer to nine actually, but prior to working Cigna at Cigna, I actually worked at an autism outpatient day treatment center uh, for about four years in Minnesota as a primary behavioral therapist. And so we utilized applied behavioral analysis there. And that was actually a really incredibly valuable time for me in my professional development, not only working with the children, but also the caregivers, educators, uh, navigating both the joys and complexities of, of autism. And this particular center that I worked at uh, was more specific to early intervention. And the age range uh, of the children that I worked with was about three and a half to 11 years old. 11 years old was kind of on the older end, uh, although we did have 11 years old, but I would say probably the most common would be seven to eight years old. And I actually carried my own caseload. I had about five kiddos uh, that I was primarily responsible for, you know, ensuring that they were being regularly assessed and their treatment goals were, were adequately implemented throughout the course of the day. Worked closely with the kiddos' teachers uh, as we were working to transition out of the day center into the school system. And also worked with healthcare providers, you know, occupational therapists, speech therapists, collaborating on all sorts of goals that could be, be leveraged. And you know, it's funny, I, I used to write treatment goals for insurance companies, uh, and then I finally joined one. And my friends and, and former colleagues would often jest that I was joining the, the big bad empire. But since working here, I've come to realize that there are a lot of resources and, pro and programs available 
in the autism space, I actually had no idea. So I've become somewhat of an apologist, uh, one would say. So uh, within the next 15, 20 some odd minutes here, you know, and obviously have time for some questions. I want to go over some resources that we do have uh, at Cigna and in, in how do we engage with our customers and their families in this space. And there's also some exciting things coming out uh, in terms of us leveraging uh, information and technology to somewhat work to predict uh, a potential diagnosis of, of autism. So I'll go over that in a second. But first, you know, I, I just kind of want to highlight some free resources that is available that are available to the, the public, uh, minus the employee assistance programs here. Uh, but we do have uh, a behavioral awareness series. And the behavioral awareness series, it's, it's a variety of topics, but we have one strictly dedicated to autism. And so we have live sessions that can later be, um, you know, you can view them afterwards on particular topics. There's usually one released every three months or so. And then we also have created just a whole suite of, of resources available uh, for anyone to use. It's, it's public, a public website. And I'll actually go there now, um, but as I'm pulling up this website, we have recently uh, announced a partnership with Holly Robinson Pete and uh, have launched a what's called an All In with Autism. And this is actually pretty interesting and exciting. And so there's resources within here that there are podcasts, there are even toolkits uh, for uh, parents or families, or caregivers to leverage, utilize um, as it relates to autism. So essentially, I, I guess the best way that I get there is I just Google uh, Cigna Autism Awareness. And so this is the, that front page. Again, this is a, do not have to be a Cigna member to access this website. Um, but again, we have uh, the awareness seminars. And so every, I believe it's every quarter, there are different topics. And I believe the most recent one was in June, uh, or excuse me, July 14th. So, you know, talking about different topics, whether it's positive reinforcement, eloping and wandering, positive parenting, um, autism, anxiety in college. So that might be a, a topic of interest if there's anyone uh, with, with older, um, older age kids who might be thinking about college. So you can sign up for these seminars. Again, it's on, you know, I just do Cigna Autism uh, Awareness. And then this is that all in with autism, which I think is, is quite interesting. So you can go here and, and there's a lot of podcasts with a variety of different uh, topics, how to find care, finding balance, um, you know, transitioning to adulthood, adult self-advocacy, uh, navigating autism for people with color. So again, really uh, informative topics that you can engage with. And here's those additional resources. There's these toolkits that you can, you can look at and leverage with its home support uh, or autism onboarding toolkits and so forth. So I highly encourage you. In fact, I'll just do this right now. I'll put it in the, um, I'll put the website in the chat. How does that sound? That way you can just look at that. Um, but, you know, um, Judy had mentioned some, uh, a concierge service of sorts uh, as to what we have uh, at, at Cigna. And I'll kind of expand on that a little bit. And because you know, again, when I started working for Cigna, I had no idea programs and resources like this actually existed within a health insurance carrier. Um, and it's pretty exciting to see that there are um, just additional things that are you can engage with us in. And so now th this is our, our market facing slide. So, you know, a lot of this is not relevant to the topic today, uh, but we have a, a team of clinicians dedicated to a, a variety of different conditions. So you can see this on the left here. Uh, and, and some of these conditions are, are quite complex and they're complex from a variety of reasons, uh, whether it's just the, the condition itself is complex or the treatment can be complex. Uh, and there's a, there, there might be a lot of ambiguity as to what, what would be appropriate uh, per se. So you can see here, we have a one team of clinicians dedicated strictly to autism. And so, you know, what happens in this particular situation is, you know, a clinician can reach out and engage with the family uh, if we receive some sort of authorization request from a, from a provider, you know, if they're requesting services for ABA, applied behavioral analysis, or in, in many instances, we have customers who will call us because maybe they, uh, maybe they just went to the, the primary care doctor visit for an annual checkup 
um, you know, at, at two years or three years of age and the primary care doctor says, you know, it's, you know, it's possible that your child has autism um, or you might want to see a specialist to get a further psych evaluation, things of that nature. And so the customers will call us and say, hey, just went to our primary care doctor. They are potentially thinking that my child might have autism or my child just received a new diagnosis of autism. I don't know what to do. Um, you know, I need to find a behavioral health provider. So our customer advocates actually on the phone will educate them and say, hey, we actually have a team of clinicians who, who are trained in this space. They have experience in this field. Um, they can reach out to you if you consent for that to happen. And they can kind of go through your, your benefit plan, uh, what is available uh, within the behavioral benefit as it relates to autism, uh, what are different types of treatments that are available? What does the authorization process look like? We'll even tap into um, uh, community resources uh, that are available locally uh, and to kind of help steer into, into resources and supports that way. Uh, there also might be situations or instances where uh, we might need to have a county involvement potentially, depending on you know, the level of need. Um, you know, the resources of the parents, you know, it, it's, it's possible, but we, we got to look into something like that. So uh, again, the autism case manager on our end will kind of work and uh, collaborate with the family or the customer, as well as the county, if appropriate, to kind of plug them into uh, some appropriate resources. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a, a salesy guy. I'm, I'm a therapist. Uh, and so, you know, some of the things that I like to highlight, particularly about this autism program, is that we do tend to see, particularly with autism, uh, lower uh, admissions to hospitals uh, or inpatient costs. And I'm talking more specifically on the behavioral health side. And I say that because I think that's really important because oftentimes, you know, depending on the child or, or, or adult or whomever and the situation or the level of experience with the caregivers, you know, this could be a new thing for the parents and they could see some pretty significant behaviors, take their child to the hospital, uh, potentially to get stabilized. Uh, you know, that can, be, that can be quite traumatic, right? Um, particularly for uh, a child or an adult with autism, that can be traumatic. And so if we can, uh, let's, let's educate and empower uh, the caregivers uh, and just kind of give them some, you know, we can give them real time in the moment coaching. Um, you know, we can say, okay, uh, let's look at, you know, leveraging outpatient care if that's appropriate. Um, you know, maybe we can avoid going to the hospital if necessary, right? Um, and so, especially in those early day stages of a caregiver where they're not, they're not really sure, like, what, what's all comes along with something like autism. They're not really sure, you know, if there's certain behaviors, how to kind of manage that. This is just a great way for them just to get that additional, uh, that additional service, that additional coaching component uh, to empower them and equip them to understand this condition all that more. So again, I, I kind of mentioned, how do people get plugged into the, this autism uh, or, or these uh, the specialty coaching? Um, really, you know, again, when we're talking about ABA, a, a lot of that, ex how it exists today is a lot of that is funneled through authorization. So typically, you know, if a, if a parent finds a, a provider and that provider who specializes in ABA, they call us to request an authorization. We do need an authorization on file. Um, to, to look at treatment progress, what are the treatment goals, is there a discharge plan? And again, I used to be on the, on the provider side of this where I would have to write, uh, you know, the goals, you know, we take assessments, we kind of see where is the person at in terms of language skills, social skills, things of that nature, and what are we trying to do here? Uh, what's, what's kind of our, our, our benchmark? What, what's kind of the end game? And, and as I mentioned in the center that I used to work at, uh, a big component of our treatment was we want to get them uh, to a point where they can be successful in school. And so if that's just a, a matter of, of giving them uh, some set of skills that can help them be successful in school and then work with that teacher in that classroom set setting and kind of and kind of pass them off where the, where the child can thrive in the school environment. So when we're looking at, uh, at um, you know, authorizations on file, we kind of see, well, what are the, what, what's the baseline behaviors? How is this person, um, you know, what kind of behaviors are they exhibiting? And what's, what's the discharge plan? What's that next step? 
Um, and then once that authorization is on file, like I said, that's going to prompt a clinician on Cigna's end to outreach to the family uh, and begin um, engaging in coaching that way. Uh, one thing that's interesting, and, th and this is relatively new too, is you know we have also with this coaching component, uh, we've been we're now doing it through an, an app called Vela, and and you don't have to do it through Vela if you don't want to or need to. Uh, but what is, this is really proving to be advantageous for customers to communicate with our uh, clinicians, because uh, oftentimes, you know, there's a lot happening at home, right? Uh, you know, especially, let's just say if it's after work, you're trying to, you know, I don't know, do something around the house, make food, clean, clean it up, you know, get your kiddo ready for bed, kind of navigating that life. Uh, it can be hard to be talking with, with somebody on the phone. So this is really just kind of being able to share notes, uh, maybe even, um, you know, potentially look at treatment plans or doing have a shared calendar where you can look at uh, appointments. So our clinician on our team can see when you're going to speech and OT or when you're having that follow-up appointment with a primary care doctor. So again, we're, we're wanting to make this simple to engage with us. We don't wanna make it complicated where you have to call and get put into a phone queue for 30 minutes and wait and wait and wait for a clinician or coordinate schedules that way. Uh, this is a real quick, tangible way that we wanna make it easier for you uh, to engage with us. Uh, and then a couple other things that I, I just kind of want to highlight, because I, I honestly think this is quite, um, quite fascinating. Um, so we're going to be doing this year, we're doing two small pilots. So we're doing kind of test and learning, research and development, and we're in, in two key areas. Uh, one of which is we're going, to, um, we're going to identify children who could potentially be diagnosed with autism, but are not yet diagnosed. Uh, and we're gonna do some specific uh, targeting uh, interventions there. That's number one, and I'll expand on that in a second. Uh, and then the other one is we really wanna be able to provide resources and support for the caregivers. Uh, more often than not, and, and, and I saw this personally when I worked at the day treatment center, and this is one of the reasons why I actually became a, uh, I went, to, I, I went to, for, to my grad school for marriage and family therapy, particularly because of my interactions with, with parents you know, just, just seeing the, 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 the toll, the, the, the stress, the anxiety, uh, you're just juggling a lot. Um, and so just, just the, the caregivers are not given as much support as needed. And so what we wanna be doing is we wanna be working with the parents. We wanna make sure that they are, uh, they're, you know, they're leveraging their mental health benefits for EAP services, for example, and they're getting, they're going to see a therapist. Uh, we wanna coach with these parents. We wanna work with them to help to alleviate all of that burden um, I mean, we're not going to take the burden away, but just be, by giving you information, resources, and support, um, that's going to help a lot. Because when you have that compounded stress, and we just see this in general with stress, uh, if you have unmanaged compounding stress, that can turn into chronic medical issues yourself. And so obviously, you know, the, the, the caregivers need to be, you know, they need to be their best selves. And so we want to make sure that they are getting uh, appropriate care and support. And so with this uh, identification for, for predicting an autism diagnosis, when I first saw that, I was like, what in the world? How are you going to be doing that? Um, and so, it, so I, I, I got off a meeting and I was like, I, was, I, was, I got a lot of, of robust information. So uh, when we're looking at, you know, potentially predicting an autism diagnosis. And so we know that through, through research, early intervention can lead to the most successful treatment outcomes when you're talking about, you know, language delays. You know, the window between two and five is, is you know, a lot of language development happens in those early years. Pretty remarkable rate. So we want to make sure we want to get folks into care within that delicate window. And so we can see through claims, um, we look at claims and age. So with this test pilot for predicting an autism diagnosis, we're looking at 18 months to four and a half years of age. And want to, we want, our, our goal is to reliably predict a diagnosis within the next 12 months. So, you know, we want the testing between, or the average time between that initial test and that diagnosis, we want to hone that in on five and a half months to 12 months. So we, we use different data points. And so we're looking at certain diagnosis codes or procedure codes. Again, when you're going to a primary care doctor visit, you know, what claims are, are happening? 
Um, you know, is there something potentially going on uh, from a developmental stage? It could be autism, but it could be something else. Perhaps after a visit with a primary care doctor, there's follow-ups with other wellness. Uh, maybe there's speech. Maybe there's OT claims costs. We even look at certain things on MySigna. Uh, if a parent either goes on MySigna, the website, or calls us, if there's certain keywords that they're using, that might flag to have us kind of see, what, well, there might be some certain needs here. So in this test and learn phase, uh, really we're, we're, we're going to essentially uh, start emailing um, folks with if they kind of fit this criteria. And we're not going to say, hey, we think your child has autism. We're not going to do anything like that. Uh, we're not even going to mention autism. Uh, because again, like I said, there could be any number of things happening that are not related to autism. But we want to kind of put, um, put it on the radar of, you know, are, is your child meeting the developmental milestones? Or, you know, I don't, again, it's pilot, so I don't know the exact words. Like, have you thought about, or do you have any concerns about milestones? And so we're going to provide resources and links to a milestone page. Again, not mentioning autism because we do not want to make any assumptions. We do not want to cause any, any concern or anything like that. Uh, but we want to progressively put it on their radar of, oh, this is actually something that I should look out for. Uh, we can engage with the clinicians at Cigna and we can kind of help coach, well, what are some key things? We want to make sure that they're going to their appointments um, in a timely manner. You know, when I worked, you know, at the center that I worked at, one of the, a, a big challenge was there were certain, um, there's a lot of stigma, uh, right? Or there can be stigma around autism and we're certainly working to reduce that. Uh, you know, there can be certain cultural stigmas uh, associated with autism where, you know, based off potentially cultural background or, or family system, you name it, there may be a reluctance to admit that, you know, I have a child with autism. And so with that reluctancy, that can increase the chance of delaying treatment. And again, we do not want that to happen. We want to encourage you. We want to support you as much as possible. We want to make sure that you are getting uh, those, those adequate supports. So I, I know that was a lot. And I don't know if there's been a lot going on in the chat. Judy, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on you to... Um, <laughs> <laughs> to, to look at those, uh, but 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 it is an exciting space uh, because again we are we are big time advocates of of autism and making sure that you have an adequate amount of resources and we want to get you into uh, that care uh, in order to you know kind of help improve the quality of life here. So, so up to this point, there hasn't been a lot of questions, although. Um, I'm not sure, Robin, has she left yet? I think she did leave. Uh, she was telling her story. But I do I do have some questions myself that I think would be helpful. Um, a lot of the people who we serve are older, so they're teens and adults. And so I just kind of want to go through s some of the typical therapies and find out, I mean, obviously, you can't approve <laughs> something in a... In a, in a web meeting, uh, but just to get a sense of how it's looked at. So you mentioned ABA, uh, which is a, a Applied Behavioral Analysis. Analysis, yeah. Um, and, um, and I know the efficacy for young children. My son was lucky enough to start doing it when he was three, which that was 27 years ago, so I do consider ourselves fortunate to have started so young. But a lot, a lot is being done now with ABA for older, um, for teens mm -hmm. and adults. Uh, so is that a treatment that is supported by uh, Sigma and, and other uh, medical insurance companies? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and, and I would say, and with all great questions, especially in the behavioral health space, you get gray, murky answers. <laughs> um, but, but it does, I mean, yeah, I mean, short answer, yes. You know, ABA certainly would be supported, uh, you know, with, with the one caveat is, is we want to look at you know, with what, with ABA, you know, what are the, you know, the presenting symptoms and what's, what's actually like the treatment what's, what's, what's our plan? You know, that's, that's yeah. kind of the biggest question that we always ask ABA providers, like, well, what is the plan? Um, because there's certain things and, in, in, you know, I, I won't get into a lot of details, but there's certain things where it's like, well, that's, that's a great plan, 
uh, but that doesn't sound necessarily like ABA would be appropriate. We do have, you know, and we oftentimes plug this into, uh, plug our customers into our, our behavioral health network where, you know, again, depending on the needs, you know, you could have uh, someone who's very high functioning and maybe they don't need ABA, uh, but we will plug them with a behavioral therapist who specializes in autism. Um, okay. Now that doesn't mean that they're doing ABA, but it could be just a regular outpatient therapy visit uh, but the focus is on autism. It's with the provider who knows autism. They work regularly with this population. Uh, we can help refine our search uh, with that. Uh, but ABA, you know, ABA is, is very specific and, and unique. Um, and there is a certain point where it, it becomes less effective. Uh, but again, it all depends on the individual person, and we all kind of look at that, like what's 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 going on that that needs the need of ABA specific. And if ABA might not be appropriate, let's explore other options. Um, again, like I said, you know, you could do outpatient treatment with a, a provider who specializes in autism. Okay, um, let me continue with this kind of name the therapy. Um, a lot of times people are wondering about the diagnosis and um, especially, you know, they may never have gotten a diagnosis or had been very difficult to get a diagnosis. Will your, will your medical insurance company typically, if there's some clear evidence, support you in getting a, di a diagnosis? Yeah, and I think that happens regularly. You know, we there was um, uh, there was a story, a, a case, a case story that I was reviewing prior to this, where it was looking at, um, and this was a real time example of a he he was fourteen, and for a good portion of his life he had an ADHD diagnosis. And that was it, and then he was admitted to a hospital because he was having some behavioral. Um, I believe it was like suicidal ideations or, or something along that nature. And then the hospital did a more comprehensive exam and evaluation and said, you know, this, this child actually has autism. Um, and so, yeah, we certainly supported, uh, certainly supported that. Uh, you know, we covered the care to get them stabilized in the hospital. And then upon discharge, uh, the, the family got plugged into that, um, that specialty case management that I had indicated. Um, and then um, they actually got referred into an ABA provider. And so one of the things with our, our, our coaching teams, uh, our, our, their specialty coaches, um, is they, they can work with you for as long as you want to work with them. As long as they're still employed at Cigna and as long as you have, still have Cigna insurance. We have had instances where uh, a family would work maybe maybe two or three conversations with our clinicians, and there have been other instances where it has been over the span of 10 years, not exaggerating. Um, and so maybe, you know, you get your needs met, five, six years pass, and you say, hey, you know what, I know I have a contact over at Cigna because my child is older, he or she's 18 years old, uh, we got some questions about treatment, we got some questions about next step, you can get a, a hold of us and we kind of go through you, what your options are. Okay. Um, I, what, someone asked a question, and I think it's a good question. Um, he said, he asked, why is this a behavioral issue when it's a capability to communicate and other stuff? It's an interesting question. Yep, that is a great question. Um, so, so ABA, so oftentimes, uh, ABA, well, I, I'll speak for uh, the center that I worked at. And, you know, I know a lot of centers replicate this, even if it's in-home, things are kind of spliced out. So, you know, there is a language delay um, with, with, with that. And then there, you know, there could be other things involved, like maybe there's occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy. That's all, you know, that's all covered under the medical benefit, but oftentimes it's done in the same place. And that makes a lot of sense, right? And so when I, you know, I would have a kiddo at my center for, you know, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and they would have maybe two hours throughout the course of the day, not at the same time, uh, where they would be dedicated strictly to speech, uh, strictly to occupational therapy. So those were different services, but they're still happening at the same day. Now, when you're doing the ABA component, 
uh, a lot of that is kind of uh, behavioral shaping and behavioral modification. So, you know, we would have a variety of different goals where, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's socialization goals, or we would have, um, you know, we would train to, it's called manding. So it would, would train them to have eye contact and we would create a reward system um, to kind of help shape you know, eye contact or requesting or, you know, giving them the verbal language skills. So a lot of that is behavioral in nature, uh, and we want to look to modify that behaviors. Uh, my, my particular center, uh, we had a, uh, we created a classroom simulation, uh, <laughs> excuse me, where, uh, you know, we would, we would essentially do, I would, I would pretend I was a teacher, and we would just do uh, basic things that you would do in school. And so again, we would, you know, we would shape how does a child interact with another child at school? How does a child raise a hand? Um, you know, a lot of that is behavioral learning through, through repetition. So that's kind of the component within ABA. Uh, a lot of the medical things, like I said, speech, OT, PT, that's, that is a separate service, but happening under the yeah. same roof. If that makes Thanks, sense. Peter. I'm going to, um, I just, I think I'm going to ask two more questions. <clears throat> Another therapy that um, is used a lot for our group is uh, the peers social skills program that was developed at UCLA. <clears throat> uh, is that something that's it, that might get coverage from an insurance company in, in your experience? Oh, you're, are you muted? No. I am muted. Yep. Okay. Can you say peers, peers, social skills, like P-E-E-R-S? Yeah, P-E-E-R-S. And you may not know, so that may be. Yeah, I don't know. I don't okay. know that. And, and it's possible. So like, you know, it, it could be, uh, I don't know. I, I can certainly look at, into that. Okay. I have not heard of that specific one. And, you know, I, I think a lot of times uh, it, it really largely depends on, the provider and what they're billing. Um, so okay. maybe they maybe they do something like a peer's social skills. Uh, maybe there's like a, a components within that social skills that they include in the ABA service as a whole. Okay. Uh, you know, for example, when I did ABA, we did ABLES. So that was, okay. um, you know, assessment language, uh, basic learning. Uh, so it, it, it kind of depends on what's the provider, what's the service they're rendering, and if they are doing insurance, uh, what's, what is the authorization process okay. looking like? So, Peter, this is my last question. So um, not everyone is lucky enough to have Cigna and have this wonderful service. So what is your advice for individuals and their parents when looking at the services that they need and how they should interface with their insurance company to make sure that that they do get the coverage that they need to get the treatments that they need. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think uh, groups like this is a fantastic start. I think, you know, identifying and cultivating a community uh, that you can kind of help bounce um, ideas, share some experiences. Uh, I don't know how, um, how common this is, but like Autism Speaks, for example, I know when I, you know, with my, um, when I lived back in Minnesota, there was a, a larger community uh, for that. So, I mean, e each insurance carrier is different. There's a lot of nuances that it's kind of hard to kind of figure out what's, what's going on, but certainly advocating and, you know, being a part of Establish advocate groups uh, such as this is a great way just to kind of understand, um, you know, what what are some resources uh, available. Okay, um, Peter. The the last question was from Andrew. She wanted to know if I could uh, pass out your email address. Is that appropriate, um, or is it? Are you more for the Cigna folk? Let me let me mull that over. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, All right. Because there, there might be a, a, a different channel that might be appropriate for that. So I can, okay. I can get back to you on that. Okay. Terrific. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to thank you. That was, that was really helpful. And it was really exciting to see how much Cigna's doing to address the needs of 
of our community. So um, thank you so yeah. much for your time. My pleasure. And, thank you for having um, me. Okay. <laughs> if there are any more questions for Peter, you can um, put it in the chat and um, maybe I'll email him uh, after we're done. But uh, thank you, Peter. All right, well, thank you much. Take care. All. Okay, have, have a nice evening. Um, <laughs> our, our next speaker is uh, Neil Steinman. And Neil, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and let me set you up. Oh, I just remembered you don't have your video on. So, <laughs> so let me, um, hold on, let me make sure we're going back to the beginning. Uh, as I mentioned before, Neil is my insurance representative, but he's he does a fantastic job and I think he's gonna share some interesting things. I also asked him to cover a little bit about life insurance since that's something he, he does. But next month we're gonna be talking about financial planning. And for those parents who are trying to think about plan for their, their children after they're gone, um, life insurance is really a, a good thing to consider um, in terms of having a financial plan to make sure that our family is safe after we're gone. So I asked him to cover that a little bit, uh, but I uh, look forward to hearing uh, Neil speak. Hi, Neil. Hey, how you doing? So. Um, yeah, I just have my picture up there. I'm not really a Zoom guy, so Judy is going to control the slides here. <clears throat> so um, I'm Neil Steinman with Orange County Health and Life, and you can advance the slide. And, oh, is that the end? No, you yeah, just go way, 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 way back. This is, this is at the very end. So if you can go way, way back to the beginning. Oh, I thought it was at, this is the beginning. Do you want, are you going to do life insurance separate? You want to do health insurance first? Yeah, health insurance is first. Okay. So, um, okay, advance the slide. And so I, I, I wanted to tackle health insurance uh, in five pieces. And again, health insurance is also called the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. And I thought if we broke it down, it might be a little easier. Uh, break it down into open enrollment periods, costs and subsidies, provider networks, plan benefits, and how to get help. Okay. Um, so it's really important to know that you cannot buy health insurance anytime you want. There are open enrollment periods, and you have to buy during an open enrollment period. Next slide. The annual open enrollment runs from November 1 to January 15th. Now, there are, outside of annual open enrollment, there are special enrollment periods. You can't make them up. They're already, you know, predetermined, but these are some uh, of the common ones, like if you have employer coverage and you lose it, if you move out of the service area of your current plan, if you get married, divorced, or have a baby, or if you lose Medi-Cal eligibility. So if one of those things happen, then you can buy outside of open enrollment. Next slide. So um, next is costs and somehow there was a slide missing there, but um, let, me, let me just mention that they did extend open enrollment because of COVID. And so um, open enrollment is still open right now. There is a special enrollment that they kept it open because of COVID. It was gonna end last week, but now they have extended it through October. So I'm telling you about open enrollment periods because it's important to know that you can't buy just any time. But right now because of COVID, it is open and it's open all the way through October. So you can get health insurance now. Okay, next slide. Okay, so as far as costs and subsidies are concerned, the Affordable Care Act, I sort of jokingly or not jokingly refer to it as the Unaffordable Care Act because it's pretty expensive. And the reason the plans are expensive is because they have a lot of benefits in them, which is a good thing. But unlike the old days where you could say, hey, I don't really want maternity care, now everybody gets it. So everybody gets all the benefits and it kind of drives the price up. And, and, and the fact that there are no more medical questions, you can get insured regardless of your pre-existing conditions. So that's a very good thing, but that also makes, um, uh, makes it a little more expensive. Boy, these are old slides. Somehow I got you the wrong slide deck. 
Um, but uh, anyway, you can advance that. We don't really need that. Um, but you may be eligible for a subsidy. Even though the insurance is expensive, you might be eligible for a subsidy based on your household income and the number of people in your household. So if you are eligible for a subsidy, then what happens is you buy through Covered California. And uh, Covered California, you may have heard of the health insurance exchanges. Well, in California, the exchange is called Covered California. So if you're eligible for a subsidy, you would still get a Blue Shield or an Anthem plan or whatever plan you're gonna get, but Covered California administers the subsidy. So you'd buy through Covered California. And, um, but you still end up with the same Blue Shield or Anthem plan or whatever. Now you can go to CoveredCalifornia.com and you, when you get there, you can click the button that says shop and compare. And if you can go to the next slide, um, when you click shop and compare, you can put in your information and you can get a quote and you can see if you're eligible for a subsidy. So you can do that all on your own. You can put in the coverage year, what's your zip code, what's your household income, how many people are in your household and what are the ages. Now it's just, and I don't wanna get in the weeds too much here, but the word household means who's on your tax return. So what they're, what they're trying to figure out is including you and possibly a spouse and your dependents, how many people are on your tax return? So when it says um, how many people are in your household, that means how many people are on your tax return, whether they're getting insurance or not. And when it says what's your total household income, that is um, what's your projected total household income for everybody in the household, for everybody on the tax return. And so just imagine that you know, if there was somebody that was 35 years old and he made 30 grand a year and it was just him, that 30 grand a year would go a lot further than if that same guy had three kids, right? So they're trying to figure out the money that you have, how far is that money getting stretched? And the more money you're getting stretched because you have more people that you're having to take care of, more dependents, then the more likelihood you're going to get a subsidy. So, um, okay, if you go to the next slide. So once you put in your information, it'll bring up various plans. There's more than just three, but this is just showing three plans. And as you can see uh, in the blueprint there where it says after a $255.16 monthly savings, that this particular individual based on the information that was input is getting a $255 subsidy every month, regardless of which plan he picks. So if you look at the plan in the middle, he's getting a plan that actually is almost a $300 plan for $41. So that's why it's called the Affordable Care Act, because if you're eligible for a subsidy, then it can become very affordable. And I would just say, be careful if you go to that Shop and Compare website, you know, because it's a little intricate as far as what information they're asking for, it might be better to call an agent or to call, you know, Covered California and have them you know, help you and walk you through that just to make sure you got it right. Okay, go to the next slide. Before we go there, I just wanted to mention something, Neil, or have you mentioned uh, about these got much more generous during COVID, right? There was... Yes, they did. And then they got ungenerous again. Not, not oh, did they? Gen yeah, yeah, that went away. So it, it did get a little more generous for a while, but it's still, as you can see, I mean, there's people that are getting $1,200 plans for, you know, $200. So there are some subsidies that are being handed out, that's for sure. And by the way, when they're asking you about household income, they're asking for not about last year, they're asking a projection for this year. What's your projected income for this year? That's what they're asking for. Okay, next slide. So if we move to provider networks, this is a really important one because um, you know, because there are open enrollment periods, if you happen to pick a plan and you think your provider is in that network and it turns out he's not, and then all of a sudden it's not open enrollment anymore, you cannot change that plan until the next open enrollment. So it's very important that if you have doctors that are important to you, that you make darn sure that they are in the plans network. And you can either check with, uh, with your agent or you can check with the insurance company, but however you check, to find out if the doctor is in the network, I would also check with your provider 
because sometimes you look up, you know, or you call an insurance company and they say, yeah, your provider's in our network. Then you go to the provider's office and the provider says, well, we used to be, but we're not anymore. And again, if it's open enrollment is closed, you can't change the plan. So it's really important. I would not just check with the provider and I would not just check with the insurance company. I would check with both. And if I get a consensus with both, then I'm satisfied. And again, that's assuming that you have a doctor that you must have, you know, you, you just can't live without that provider. Okay, next slide. Um, this, I already said that if, if you find out that your provider is not in the network and open enrollment is over, you can't change plans until the next open enrollment. So that's why it's so important to make sure you've got that nailed down. Next slide. So this is Blue Shield. This is what their website looks like if you're looking for a provider. And again, I, I it, it does get a little complicated um, trying to pick the right plan and the right network. And you know, you can make a mistake. So I, I would I would have an agent do it for you or call up the insurance company or something. Um, you can see there that there is a special network for mental health. So most of the insurance companies do have a separate special network for mental health. Um, go to the next slide. And so a lot of the mental health, I've, I've been finding, you know, unlike Peter, I'm not a specialist in mental health, but I do have people that, you know, that do need that care. And I've been hearing that um, the mental health providers seem to be really jammed. And I imagine that it might partially because of COVID, I'm not really sure, but a lot of them do have telehealth. And boy, does that really help if you're able to use telehealth? It seems like a lot more people are available and you don't have to wait as long for an appointment. So just want to let you know that you can access a lot of these people um, by the phone and have your appointment over the phone. Next. Okay, now moving on to the next topic, which is plan benefits. Uh, the plans are really kind of standardized now. The, there's four categories, basically bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And um, just like any insurance, the, the less you pay for the insurance, the more you'll have out of pocket. So the bronze plan is the cheapest plan, and that's the plan that you'll probably have a lot of out-of-pocket. Most people just get a bronze plan if they really don't use it often, but they're just getting it just in case something really serious happens. But if you're using the insurance, you know, you'd probably be better off with a silver, gold, or platinum plan. Next slide. So the plans, they don't, they don't, differ as far as benefits are concerned. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of times people will say to me, what benefits does the plan have? Well, all plans have hospital, you know, they all have emergency room, they all have doctor visits. The benefits isn't what's different from plan to plan. It's the out-of-pocket cost that's different from plan to plan. So again, on a bronze plan, you're going to have higher deductibles, higher co-pays, and so on. On a platinum plan, you're going to have lower out-of-pocket, lower co-pays and lower deductibles and so on. So you don't have to really wonder well, what, are, what benefits are different. It's just that you're going to have more out of pocket if you get a lower cost plan. Next slide. So off the record, I didn't write this down because um, I was going to make a possible generalization on which plan might be better, you know, um, which I obviously cannot do without knowing anybody here or talking about your situation. Um, you know, you got to look at your own situation and figure out what would be the best plan for you. But very general as he's staying, I would say that the silver plan very often is really a good plan. And the reason why, again, not so much the bronze because that one you have a lot of out of pocket and if you're using the plan a lot, you know, that may not be the best plan for you. But if you're looking at silver, gold and platinum, the silver plan has a deductible, but they waive the deductible for just about everything except hospitalization. So another way of saying that is that there's no deductible unless you go in the hospital. So a silver plan, you get first dollar benefits, meaning that as soon as you have a claim, you get a benefit immediately. There's no deductible unless you go in the hospital. So, you know, you just pay a copay. So you get benefits right away. Now the gold plan, the platinum plans might have lower copays and a lower deductible. But if you look at the difference in cost, you know, you might get a gold plan that costs you $100 more a month for what, a $10 lower copay? So a lot of times um, the extra cost of a gold or platinum plan doesn't really warrant 
a slightly lower copay. But again, you know, that depends on your own situation. I'm just trying to make a generalization. Okay, next slide. Um, as far as how to get help, um, three ways that I can think of. You can work directly with the carrier. Um, that's a little cumbersome because, you know, you might want to find out, is my doctor in that work and what's the cost? Am I eligible for a subsidy from Blue Shield? Then you do the same thing with Anthem. Then you do the same thing with HealthNet. Then you do the same thing with each carrier. And then you've got to compare everything on your own. And that gets a little, a little cumbersome. Um, if you are eligible for a subsidy, then you can work directly with Covered California if you want. Now, if you're not eligible for a subsidy, um, the problem with working directly with Covered California is they don't have all the plans. They only have the plans in which you can get a subsidy. There are more plans available outside of Covered California if you're not eligible for a subsidy. And the third method, and I'm not saying this because I'm an agent, but um, working with an agent is a good um, uh, alternative because it doesn't cost anything to work with an agent. They generally represent all the carriers and covered California, so they can determine if you're eligible for a subsidy and if your doctors are in network and, you know, what the costs are and all that kind of stuff. Just, you know, it's like a one-stop shop. Okay, next. And the last final note, um, now I, I just wanna mention this one thing that you may or may not know. And, and I know that you know that Medi-Cal is for low income individuals and Medicare conversely is for people that are over 65. I just wanted to make that differential. Medicare is available to people under 65 if they've been on social security disability for 24 months. Sometimes people don't know that, but if a person has been on social security disability for 24 months, they become eligible for Medicare. And again, off the record, I would say uh, in most cases, I'd probably rather be on Medicare than on individual health insurance. So that's just a good thing to know. Okay, uh, next slide questions. Okay, and, and um, should we stop here and take questions on this and then do you wanna do the uh, life insurance? Or yeah, you... I, 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 think, I think we should do that. Okay, then the, let me stop sharing. Um, so for, for our folks, I know there's a, this has been a lot of information. Typically, if you're a son or a daughter of somebody who's employed, they get their insurance through their employer, typically. Mm. One thing that some people don't know is that if, if, if they have a child who's disabled, normally that ends at age 26, but if you have a, a child that has a disability, you can get that extended. So that's how typically your parents will be paying for insurance. But if they don't have that, then they'll go with a private insurance. And the material that Neil covered today really helps explain that there's a lot of options with uh, private insurance. If you have SSI, then typically you will be receiving Medi-Cal. And previously we've had um, speakers from, with last year we had someone from Cal Optima who's a Medi-Cal provider. And then uh, Neil talked about if you're on SSDI for two years, then you can get on Medicare. So those are all kind of a, a variety of, of things that you might not have realized. And we'll see, are there any questions? And if you- Let me, If I can just mention one thing, because you were talking about employer coverage. Yes. Uh, if you are eligible for employer coverage, then you are not eligible for a subsidy. So Covered California considers the fact that you are eligible for employer coverage, that is your subsidy because usually an employer pays like 50% or whatever. So again, if you're eligible for employer coverage, you're not eligible for a subsidy. Okay, so we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, one person wants your email address, so you can maybe type that in the chat. Um, okay, one question is, can different household members sign up for different health insurance plans under Cal Covered California? Yes. Okay, yeah, it's determined by each individual chooses it, right, Neil? Well, the plan is 
is bought at one time, but you know, you can say, well, this person wants this and that person wants that. Yeah, you can have different plans. Okay. Um, someone was uh, trying to understand the deductible here. So um, let me look at his question. Why is there a 20% deductible? <laughs> There, there isn't. There, you're thinking of co-insurance. There's something called a deductible, and then there's something called co-insurance. And I don't want to burn anybody's brain out, but a, a, a deductible, you know, if you have a deductible like a five, you know, actually that doesn't really apply here because the deductibles, like I said, on a silver plan, there is no deductible unless you go in the hospital. So let's say you go in the hospital and you have a $5,000 deductible. So you go in the hospital and the first thing is you pay your $5,000 first before the insurance company pays anything. And then after you've paid your deductible, then you start paying co-insurance, that's the 20%. So you paid your 5,000, now you start paying co-insurance of 20%. But you own, once you've paid out of pocket a certain amount, which is about $6,000, so that would include your deductible and your co-insurance, then the plan pays the rest for the rest of the year. You have no, that's your maximum out of pocket. And that's, I know it's a little complicated, but you pay your deductible and then you pay co-insurance until you reach your maximum out of pocket. And so yeah, yeah. So Saval get asked that question. It's, um, it's pretty complicated really when you first get into it to understand all the different elements of your medical insurance. Wouldn't you say, Neil, is there an easy place that people can go to learn more about it if they want to? I, I don't really, I don't think so. Really. <laughs> then, I think, let me, let me put, United, let me, United let, States Medical Insurance for Dummies. <laughs> yeah, there should be. Um, I, I, think the, I think the way to look at it is that most plans have a maximum out of pocket of, let's say, about $6,000. So if you go through a year and, and your insurance expenses are $30,000, you you know, your plan might work okay or you might have to pay some deductible and you go, gosh, I didn't get that much out of my plan. In my opinion, if you didn't get that much out of plan and you had less than, you know, 20,000 or whatever out of pocket insurance expenses, count your blessings, you know. But if you had a 100,000, 200,000, million dollar, $2 million claim and you had the same $6,000 out of pocket, then the plan would seem pretty darn good, right? So the thing is, is that, yeah, you might have six grand out of pocket and the plan, the least, the, the fewer expenses you have, the least the plan is gonna look like it's doing a lot for you because you don't have a lot of out-of-pocket out of expenses, but it's there in case something major happens, then you still only have that six grand out of pocket. Thanks, thanks, Neil. Okay, this, this one, let's see if you know the answer to this. Would an employer coverage cancel out your Medi-Cal or Medicare? Would employer, well. I, so let's say well, Sabog no. starts working for a company. He has Medi-Cal and now he has an employee medical insurance. Would he lose his Medi-Cal? Well, you know, I'm, I'm actually not a Medi-Cal expert in relationship okay. to um, health insurance. I am a little more with Medicare, but not so much with health insurance. But I can tell you with Medicare, you can have um, you can have employer cover. Well, you can have Medi-Cal and Medicare. You can have both. It's called Medi Medi. You can have Medicare and Medi-Cal. Um, as far as employer coverage is concerned, you have a choice, and you would pick one or the other. I mean, you can have both. Yeah, usually I've been in situations where I've had two insurance companies and you end up having one be the primary and one be the secondary. And probably the Medi-Cal or the Medicare would be your secondary and then your company. We'd need to check this out. But usually one is the primary and one is the secondary and the primary pays more, but then the secondary can kind of pay um, some portion that may not be covered. Yeah, well, so. with Medicare, yeah, you can definitely have Medicare and Medi-Cal. Medicare is primary, and what Medi-Cal does is it pays any co-pays or anything that Medicare doesn't pay, so it's very helpful. As far as employer coverage, yeah, you can have you can have Medicare and employer coverage. The question is, do you really need all of that? You know, 
uh, sometimes it's better to make a comparison and pick one or the other. Okay. I'm wondering if some of you understand the idea of medical insurance. So maybe take, taking that down a, a level a little bit. The idea is going, if you get sick, really sick, it can be very, very expensive. Doctors are very expensive and they're getting more expensive and going to the hospital is really expensive. So medical insurance, insurance of any kind helps protect you from getting hit too hard with um, the cost of, of staying healthy. So that's why it's such an important thing because you just don't know. You don't know if one day you're gonna wake up and be very sick and, and need to see a doctor and you need to you know, you need to have the money to pay for that. And so the insurance helps you achieve that. Yeah, you said it right. It, it eliminates risk or it eliminates the unknown. In other words, if an insurance plan is going to cost you 200 a month, are, do you would you rather pay that 200 a month and know that you're not going to have some big bankrupt, you know, situation down the road? Or do you want to take the chance? You know, it just eliminates the risk. It eliminates the unknown. Yeah. And Andrea answered the question about if you're working, it says the employer plan is primary, medical, medical is secondary, which is what I thought too. Okay, here's a good question from Diane. I need to get coverage for my daughter who sees specific doctors. Medical would not cover these doctors. Well, we need to look at private insurance based on my income. Daughter has not been able to acquire a job. Well, if you're, if you're going to try to get a subsidy and you're going to try to get coverage through Covered California, when you put in your income, if you're el eligible for Medi-Cal, then that's what you're going to get. Um, now, what you can do is you can say, um, I don't want, and a lot of people do this, I don't want Medi-Cal. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to ask for a subsidy. I'm going to just buy insurance and pay the full price and, and skirt Medi-Cal. So you, 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 if you're eligible for Medi-Cal, then that's what you get. That is your subsidy. But if you don't want Medi-Cal, then you would have to pay the full price and not ask for a subsidy at all. Does that so, make sense? Yeah, and Diane, I think you may want to go off mute, but it you know, kind of depends how old your daughter is. And also, are you work is are you or your husband, or is there a husband working that could have coverage for your daughter as well? Because, like I said, you, your daughter may be able to stay on your medical insurance if you're employed um, past the age of 26. So Diane. there are some other options. Diane, you want to? Recommend that you, um, last year we had someone from Cal Optima, and there may be some other options there that you hadn't considered. So before you start making any big changes, you may want to watch that. And the slides are downloadable and they might be able to, to work with you. So I would definitely um, try contacting them as well. For lack of a better term. It can uh, be frustrating. It really can. Um, are you asking for the county or for like a private health insurance, like a blue shield or something? So previously I had uh, some coverage through working at Amazon. Uh, after, after a work injury and leaving to, to go back to college as a student full time, I... I'm back on Medi-Cal. I apparently was never dropped off Medi-Cal because they never took or they never processed the cases or they were never going to they were going to keep everybody who was on the books on the books until they considered COVID to be done and over with. So technically I was never off of yeah. Medi-Cal. So like just last Thursday, I had a brief heart attack about having to deal with uh, enrollment dates, and I'm 
the deadlines tomorrow, et cetera. But apparently, no, I never got, I never dropped off Medi-Cal in the first place. So I never had to worry about anything. So now I have to say, I bought a plan for, through Covered California for the month of August, but apparently I don't, I have to cancel that now because I was never off of Medi-Cal in the first place. So I spent 80 plus dollars for essentially no reason. Well, I, I think, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, what I was gonna say is the people that covered California are really pretty good. And, and I think from what I'm hearing you say, I think I would call them because you have an account on covered California and when you have an account on Covered California, Medi-Cal can reach right into your account and make changes. And um, so I, that, I think I would start by calling them. They're very helpful. And, and if they can't answer your question, I think that they would direct you into the, you know, to the right place. Um, if you ever have an insurance plan, I think the best thing to do is turn your ID card over and look at the number on the back. The customer service people are there specifically for that reason, and they're usually pretty good. Now, I know that, you know, calling Medi-Cal can be a little, a little cumbersome, but usually calling an insurance company direct or certainly calling Covered California, um, that's what they're there for is to answer those questions. So, so I wanted to show you, okay, I'm on our website, ocasburgers.org. I'm in the resources section. And here's a button that says educational videos. So I'm going to click on that and it's going to pop up a list of all the lectures we've had since COVID. Okay. And you can see that we've had quite a few. And there was one on insurance and autism treatments from last year. And I've mentioned this a few minutes ago. And Tiffany Kaka. Amanu, Hawaiian name, uh, was one of the speakers. You can watch the video. Here's a link to her slides. And she has places you can go within Cal Optima to ask for assistance and ask questions. Um, there was a lot of really good information and with phone numbers of people to call. So um, I would... As I said, I would recommend um, calling to find out answers to your questions um, because they have a pretty good, um, and, and you could even call her um, and see if she can help you get the answer to your question. People that are around that can help you with that one-on-one -on -one, would be Disability Rights California. Sometimes they can help you advocate. And we had a session on self-advocacy, so there might be some clues there. Um, but if you have a specific question, you know, you can email it to me and, and maybe I can help you uh, navigate it. Okay, let's see, any more questions here? That might help. Yeah, let me just take five minutes because there's something that I think might help people if they're interested in that. Okay. Literally right. five minutes because I just really want to get to one slide. Let's see. Let me go. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, basically there, there's, there's two types of life insurance. There's term insurance where you just buy it for a short period of time. And then there's whole life insurance where you buy it for your whole life. Um, and I just wanted to really give you a website. I think, uh, and again, these slides that I sent you were not most recent. If you could advance one more, I'm just trying to get to a, a web. Can you actually, can you go back to, there it is. That website, if you want to write that down, the thing that will happen if you go to that website is it will walk you through very simply. You put in your name, you put in your age, you put in your weight, um, you put in a few things, and it will enable you to um, uh, see the price of a health of a life insurance plan, just so you can play with it. If you go to that website, nobody's going to call you. If you could just advance one more slide, 
Um, yeah, so right there. So for example, let's say that somebody put in um, uh, 42 years old and you know my health is three stars out of five and you know my zip code is 92626. And then this screen will come up and it'll show this guy that based on his information, he can get a million dollars worth of term insurance, a 10 year term, for $25 a month. So it's just good to know because a lot of people think that this is more expensive than it really is. Now, what you can do is that where it says a million dollars at the top, you can move that slider bar to the left and say, well, gosh, how much would it cost for 500,000? And then all those figures will change. So that's really the only side that, you know, you can wait for the financial guide. That, that would probably be more appropriate. But if you just want to go to a website, just get some kind of an idea of what does this stuff cost, that's a good website to do that.